Okay, today I have the great opportunity to talk to somebody whose work I followed for a while, and also I'd say that I, I see him often. And the reason I see him often is because if your Facebook feed looks anything like mine, you see him often too. Uh, his name is Mike Monday, and he is, um, I've seen him uh, spoken of as being like the, the Tony Robbins of music productions. <laughs> um, he, is, uh, he is a person that is sort of a life coach for people who are obsessed with electronic music. And so I hope that that's a fair statement. Would you say that's true? Uh, it it has been said. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have a kind of love-hate uh, relationship with the life uh, coaching world right. and tend to think that the best kind of growth comes in the actual doing of a specific thing unless you have an underlying, uh, you know, mental health issue or something like that, which is com something completely different. But, but you know, self-help for help, self-help's sake doesn't really uh, appeal to me. One of the things that I, in, in the studio, realized was that actually I was using what I was doing in the studio as a tool to grow uh, in many different ways. And uh, so that's where what I do now came from. Very interesting. So um, for people who aren't familiar, as familiar with you as I am, why don't I have you just explain really quickly what it is that you do as sort of like, I'll, I'll call it your gig, because it's kind of like a combination of a, a service job and a gig and, and an artistic pursuit. So why don't I have you explain it a little bit? Yes. So essentially, you're quite lucky, actually, because I just did uh, some thinking uh, around this. And essentially, I realized that what I do is I help music makers, music producers, composers, particularly in the uh, electronic space, expand their freedom to be more creative. Uh, and I know that sounds like one of those little taglines, doesn't it, underneath? <laughs> it does. <laughs> yes, but, but, but essentially that, that is, in a nutshell, that's the kind of lift pitch. And I do that in uh, various different ways. The, the most obvious and the most visible way uh, at the moment is in helping people use their minds more effectively uh, and their time more effectively uh, and their equipment more effectively, essentially, um, in order to make much more music, be much more creative and be innovative. No. Uh, and then, you know, there are other ways uh, of doing it as well by you know, developing uh, other streams of income through, you know, from their music, the kind of stuff that springs from their music as well, because obviously that can free up uh, time as well, because a lot of people are stuck in that situation where they're touring all the time, right. which uh, is created by the music that they make. <laughs> but when they're touring all the time, they can't make the music because it's such a punishing uh, schedule. Right. So I'm actually helping you know quite a few people who are touring all the time to make music while touring. That's fantastic. Yeah. I will say right up front that I have done some of your, your courses, particularly the one that really helped me out a lot was one called Idea Explosion, which was sort mm -hmm. of like a way to reapproach developing your, your music with some, some very specific exercises and spe specific strategies that kind of helped me re rethink about how I was making music and what it is that I wanted to produce. I, I found it really helpful. Um, right. I've also gone through your YouTube videos and um, I got, uh, you had a free download at one point called the Re Magic Track Reanimator, which was like a great way to see if a track was worth trying to, you know, recover out of the dustbin or whatever. Um, yep. But I, I found your work really exciting because, you know, and I almost feel bad already about having like gone down the road of, of the life coach thing, because so often that is like general discussions about stuff that could fit anybody. And I would say that in your case, you have like put together uh, roadmaps for how to get from point A to point B, assuming that point A and point B are, are paths on the road that music producers will run into. Yes, that's exactly it. I think what I uh, decided to do was first um, ap approach the areas that I had the most difficulty with <laughs> in uh, my creative process, because what, what, what ended up happening towards the end of my career, that it was almost like the music that I was making was simply the results of my creative experiments. <laughs> It was like it didn't really matter what was coming out to me anyway, um, as much as it was almost like a kind of lab, a laboratory for investigating my creative process and uh, myself. 
you know, in my conversations with other people uh, I was meeting, I could see that I was doing things slightly differently and looking at it in a different way, which would really help them. That got me extremely energized and um, excited as I started to do that. So now you open a door there and I'd like to go through it. And that is uh, the career you had um, prior to taking uh, taking on this role of helping people uh, become better and more productive producers. Mm -hmm. uh, you were a music music producer yourself and a fairly accomplished one. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what what it is that you were doing and what ended up kind of being the end of that? Because what I notice is when I look at your discography, there's sort of like an end point to it, you know? Yes. <laughs> yes, there definitely was. A, it definitely has been an end point to it, but, you know, never say never. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, what, ha what happened was I did music at Oxford University, a music degree at Oxford University, and uh, joined, well, I didn't join, I created a funk band with, a couple, a few guys, one of whom ended up being one of the members of Groove Armada. I don't know if you're familiar with yes. uh, them. But anyway, we came out of university and lived in a flat in South London. And he bought a, he, I can't remember what it was, an EX, EXS24, I think. So he got a bank loan out, got an EXS24, and he did. And this massive old mixing desk, I can't remember what it was called, and some speakers and a DAT recorder and started making music pretty much with uh, that. And because I was there and uh, I started making music with him as well and anyway so we started making music as a band called Beat Foundation that got some early success uh, we were one of the four tracks I think on the first ever Sasha essential selection compilation nice. and and so we got kind of some success in in that sort of area anyway to cut a long story short he went on to do Groove Armada and I went, kind of went on eventually after a massive period of uh, creative block um, went on to sort of become Mike Monday. My, my real name is uh, Mukhopadhyay. I'm half, half Indian. And anyway, so I and uh, as Mike Monday, I kind of got some uh, degree of success. And yeah, that that was it. I mean, I, I spent the latter part of my career just producing uh, music, both for the dance floor and kind of in album form. And what happened towards the end was I saw the writing. You know, as um, DAWs started uh, happening. Um, I, and I saw that the, you know, like in, in every uh, industry, the uh, commoditization of the thing, so the, dis, the you know, the distribution and the, the, the creation of music uh, and, and, you know, in, in every industry it's happened where the price has gone down. So therefore, lot, lots more people are able to do it. I saw that the, the writing was on the wall for very many parts of the industry. So I started to, dis well, I actually made a decision to interact with my fans more closely uh, and decided to start blogging about my creative process, as that's one of the things I was most interested in. Mm -hmm. And the long and the short of it is that in doing that, I found something that really inspired me and uh, kind of energized me and motivated me in kind of ever deeper and uh, more exciting ways. So what started out as being almost like a, a way to engage with my fans for my music and promote my music uh, became actually the single thing that I decided to uh, focus on at the moment anyway. Sure. When you made that transition, did you, and you started blogging about your creative process, did you find that like a lot of your fans also happened to want to produce music? Yes. And uh, I mean, a lot of them were producing music. I mean, I, I would suggest that for a, certainly in the electronic space anyway, a lot of the, your, your most the, the most rabid fans, the ones that are kind of the, the core fans are also going to be either wanting to or are producing music. So, so that, that, you know, that was something I identified. And, and I mean, in order to sort of, I read the, I don't know whether you know, the Kevin Kelly article, the, the thousand true fans yes. concept. Mm -hmm. So I read that uh, at the time it came out and uh, he, he put it up on his uh, blog. And um, so I set about identifying who <laughs> were likely to be my most core fan base, and I realized it would be people who were making music. Right. <laughs> so that, that was where that kind of idea came from. Well, but it's also, it was also a timely time to, to do something like that because sort of the democratization of music making really mm -hmm. came, became pervasive in that mid-2000s mm -hmm. time frame. And so all of a sudden, it was more likely even people that, 
just wanted to make music, if you could help propel them into starting, they'd have access to the tools to do it. Exactly. So there are benefits and you know downsides to to everything. Right. And I think it was a tr- it was like well I could either kind of shake my fist at at the world and what was going on, or I could uh, make. Uh, lemonade from lemons and I, right. I i chose the last one and that's kind of how i've ended up in this i mean if you'd have told me that was what was going to happen i would have uh, said you were crazy but <laughs> right, <laughs> you right. Know. going to music school at oxford and getting chops enough to to be doing the kind of production work that you're doing kind of implies uh some musical background before then what was your youth like what kind of what kind of background came from that that helped you become sort of the, both the musician, but also the, the inspirer that you are. Uh, what, what's your background that puts you in a position to do that? I think uh, the, the kind of overarching thing is that because I'm half uh, Indian and half English, okay. I, was, I was born in Calcutta and uh, moved to uh, the UK when I was a, uh, like a little baby, uh, like about two years old or something. But my first breaths and my first sounds and everything that I heard and you know, it was very, very alien. I mean, uh, it was Calcutta in the 70s so that was well I mean, it still is an intense place but it was even more of an in- intense place and we moved to the center of england the black country which uh, at that time was a very working class area so uh, had certain you know views on race <laughs> a, a lot of people right. did and i and so it was kind of like I, i've always been an alien you know where, wherever i've gone and uh, i'm white but I have Indian blood, mm-hmm. and so I was very often in a situation where I was in the uncomfortable situation to be exposed to things not directed at me, but which impacted me. Right, right. <laughs> you know, into, and so this gave me a kind of uh, objective view of <laughs> uh, people and uh, humanity, right. which I think has allowed me to kind of draw parallels between various uh, different things. So that's a kind of overarching thing: is is that I generally see things. Uh, from a kind of outside perspective. I, I think that that's actually, I wouldn't say that that's common, but I think that, that some people have been able to do that. This sense of alienation from normal life kind of puts you in a position to be introspective at an early age, right? Yes. And I was an only, I was an only child as well, so I ah, think that probably right. comes into it uh, as well. So I think, uh, yeah. Um, but then in terms of the music uh, side of it, I mean, I wasn't from a family uh, of uh, musicians at all, but uh, my mum used to play a lot of music uh, around the house, mainly classical. And I started the piano when I was seven and then went on to do the bassoon, the saxophone. And I was a choral scholar at Oxford University. I was in the National Youth Orchestra playing the, the, the double bassoon. I see. Uh, so kind of classically trained. And I just did, did uh, lots of things. But I was always surrounded by people. I was never the best musician in the room, never. I was always the, one of the worst. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that that, that has gone on throughout uh, my career even though I, I did a music degree and everything, I was always surrounded by these kind of, what I sort of saw as uh, geniuses and I always struggled uh, with the creative process. And I think that's also, it, and just with music, it never came easy to me. Right, right. And in fact, I don't think it comes easy to, to anyone, to be honest, mm-hmm. but I, the perception, my perception was that there were people who kind of, they just kind of had to sit down and this amazing stuff came out of their fingers. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? uh, and f- for me, it was always a uh, struggle. And I actually started to appreciate that, that struggle towards the end of uh, my career. That's really interesting. Now, I'm kind of curious, do, do you feel like this like roommate uh, thing that you did, did that somehow activate you into doing music just because all of a sudden there was some gear available and you had the opportunity to try it? Or was that something that you had kind of secretly hosted in your brain up prior to that? Okay. Yeah. So I'm definitely much more of an opportunist. So yes, it wasn't a, <laughs> a, a predetermined uh, plan. So it was, uh, it, it was just kind of what I f- uh, fell into. So I actually wanted to be a saxophonist. Ah. Originally, that was my, that was the plan. It's it's funny. I'm on this podcast because I've l- listened to some of your uh, other episodes with you know people who are fully immersed in the, the world of uh, you know that kind of intersection between uh, music and tech. And I always counted myself as a technophobe. Oh, right. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, and so the figuring out of how to make music with MIDI at the time was you know one of the biggest mountains I've ever had to climb. You know, without 
or YouTube tutorials and all that kind of stuff at the time because it was the, it was 94 right. when when I started it, it actually showed me that I wasn't a I wasn't a complete technical no hope it was just a case <laughs> of uh, learning something and, and figuring it out but it was never really I was never interested in the machines for the machine's sake it was always for me it was always what the machines can do so it was always getting to an end result which was a piece of music that was the the reason I was doing absolutely everything and at the point at which it worked that was it. There wasn't any with me anyway, figuring out how this synth works or mm -hmm. all the things this synth can do. It mm -hmm. was figuring out how I make a piece of music with this synth, right? <laughs> which is a kind of, I think it's a fundamentally different uh, energy to it. It is. But yeah. I think that what you kind of talk about right there is a trap that a lot of people get into. They get <laughs> so interested in what a machine can do that they forget that the primary purpose of it was to make music, right? Having said that, though, if you are naturally interested in that, then that can be a wonderful thing to to do. Well, unless, of course, you just want to become a kind of an expert on sound design, you, you know, unless you want to actually right. become a sound designer, mm -hmm. that's something different. But if you want to produce music, then that thing can be something that that will really inform and enrich your music, but it has to be in the context of finishing stuff. And I think people do mistake the interest in that with the purpose of it, exactly uh, as as you said. And it's, you know, I I was like, you can make a great piece of music with a dustbin lid, uh, <laughs> right. if, you know, if you take uh, the right approach and you, you practice enough, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially. So I, I think that's the, uh, you know, I, I kind of view these all of these things as tools, but I think it's it's being able to identify what it is that excites, motivates, and energizes you, and doubling down on that thing, and almost like ignoring everything else. You know, uh, that's what I encourage a lot of my uh, clients to do. It's like, what is the thing that you love more than anything else? And if that is designing sounds on a synth, then how can you almost, you know, how would you make a piece of music? Where you only ha where you, you could only do that, you right. know, or at least you you minimize everything else, and that is your thing. Yeah, um, that's actually that's actually interesting to consider because, and I have to say, for myself, I tend to think of there being almost a dichotomy of there's sound design or there's music making, and the two are like fundamentally different things to do. But then mm -hmm. they, what you're saying is really is really important, which is that one of them isn't necessarily preferable to the other. It's just you have to have a goal of what you want to do and pursue that goal instead of pursuing all possible goals. But that's exactly it. And I think the, the problem that a lot of people who are starting out, uh, mu music producers, is that because all information to do absolutely everything is available immediately for free, mm -hmm. that brings along with it the assumption that you need to know everything in order to do anything. Trouble is, if you know everything, I mean, you know, I was uh, talking to uh, one of my mastermind members the other day, and I said, and I think, if you did know everything about all of the possible things that you could do, you would probably end up writing lift music. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you attempted to, to use all of the techniques available and all of the equipment, then it would just be nothing. Right. And it's like this not being able to do certain things then will inform your music like it can be certain things and it cannot be other things and that's great that's exactly what you want you know so i do encourage uh, the people I, I help to figure out what what it is they can do now with what they have now rather than always waiting because there are so many different things that uh, are waiting to make great music and i, I see people doing it all, all the time oh I'll, I'll finish uh, you know i'll finish this album when i've like this or when I've bought that bit of gear or when I've and it's like well w w what can you do now because those limitations those things that you don't have are as important to the end result as as what you do have well I've seen some like tragic uh cases of that too there was there was somebody I knew was a phenomenally talented kid he was sure that as soon as he gets that next piece of gear then he's finally going to be set and he could start working and it made me sad because every time he would get on any piece of gear it just music flowed out of him in a wonderful way, yeah. but he couldn't mentally allow himself to make music until he had reached some kind of gear purchasing goal. And that was, that yes. was a little unfortunate. 
Yes, it does happen, and a lot of people who who come to me are in that situation. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was going to ask you: Have you ever had a situation where, after talking to somebody, you said, "You know, it sounds like your real goal is to be a gear collector, and so focus on that"? <laughs> or have you have you always found a way to help them make at least some music? I, I think if they were they got to the point at which they were actually uh, speaking to me, I think they will have already made the decision uh, that they right. don't want to be a gear Just collector. A gear maybe collector. the right. yeah. So maybe the gear collection is a is a an advanced form of procrastination. Right. So so what they're actually doing is using the purchasing of a, a, a piece of gear as a fee, they get that feeling that they're doing something useful. Mm-hmm which is kind of avoiding the the actual thing because i think you know i I, i'm going to contradict myself now but i said you know so i was never one of those people for which music comes easy well i think that is probably just a a function of (laughs) kind of my past and my beliefs about myself because i don't actually think that music comes easy to to anyone all the time and at some point you are going to face that barrier of finishing something right you know that inevitable and it's just a function of the social fear that we have of, of judgment, you know, which, which basically is processed in the same part of our brain in the same way as the, the fear of death. Mm-hmm. Because I think uh, scientists thought that, think that because our brains are essentially the same, the same as when we were, you know, hunter gatherers, to be ostracized from the tribe was to die. Right. So therefore, it's processed in the same way. So whenever you finish a piece of music, you are facing that, to, which to your, to your mind is the fear of death. And I think people th- uh, hope or want that piece of gear to kind of be the solution to not feeling that fear of judgment because they mistake the doubt that comes at the end of the process. You know that? So you've loved it and you've been, go- you've been really going for it. You're like, oh, this is amazing. And, and then at the end of the process, there comes this doubt and they mistake that for reality when, I, when actually what all it is is a signpost that you're about to finish. It's like, oh, I'm about to finish. Oh, there's going to be judgment. <laughs> And that's it. And so they go and buy a piece of gear just to, to kind of put it off, put, right. put off the inevitable. Sure. That's an interesting perspective because one of the things I know I and a lot of people have trouble doing is is finishing pieces. But it oftentimes, it, it does seem to be sometimes starting a piece can be hard because you might not feel inspired. Or sometimes continuing to work on a piece might feel might might be hard because you're not sure that it's going in a useful direction but there's something about coming to the end of a piece it's it's like your mind works overtime to just find problems oh this sounds yeah. like mud oh this doesn't sound complex enough oh people are going to think that you're you didn't use enough chords or people are going to think you're trying to use too many chords or whatever, you know. Yeah. And it's amazing the kind of things you'll conjure up in your head in order to try and give yourself the, uh, an excuse to not continue, not finish. Absolutely. It's it, it's one of the things that I get people to focus on is all of those thoughts and feelings that come up in the creative process is, is detaching from them and understanding that they're not real. They're just things that come up. Mm-hmm. And how can it be that... At, at one point in the process, you're absolutely overjoyed with excitement. And then with essentially what is the same piece of music, later on in the process, that you're absolutely terrified. Has the music changed enough for, for, there, for there to be those two different states of being about the music? No. All that's happened is that you're at a different stage in the process. So kind of attaching, like believing all of those thoughts and feelings in the moment about the music is actually not a particularly good way of moving forward. What you have to do is almost keep moving forward no matter what, say that you finished, and then almost curate all of the moments, all of your feelings about that piece mm-hmm. of music over time, and then come to a decision right. as to whether you're going to release it onto the onto, onto an unsuspecting public or not. <laughs> and and it's like, uh, I, I think that the mistake is, tr- like I call it actually the tyranny of like. Mm-hmm. So the one thing that we all naturally use to either move forward or not move forward is, do I like this? The trouble is that our likeometer is extremely unreliable and uh, based upon all kinds of inputs which aren't to do with the music. So... It's kind of like detaching from that and 
allowing yourself not to believe all of those uh, feelings about the music in the moment. You're not always right. I mean, how many times have you loved something one minute and then on a totally different day, you're like, what, what on earth was I thinking? <laughs> right. And the other way around. I mean, you know, it, 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 but yet we still use this. I like it now. So therefore it's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? right. um, and I, I think it's just about kind of uh, detaching from it, making progress no matter what, and then deciding what you're going to take forward and what you're not going to take forward. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you do uh, a lot in your work, both in the, I noticed this was the case in the videos that are freely available on YouTube. Um, it was in the course that I took, and it seems to be sort of like a bedrock in your method. And in fact, it's even sort of in built into some of your taglines. You have this one tagline that's like, start now, finish fast. What, mm -hmm. you're, what you seem to really be focused on is almost saying get off your butt is more important than extending your talent or worrying about your ability or anything else. That, that doing stuff is the key. I mean, to the point where you get involved in discussions about distractions and how distracting the computer can be. I'm sure my podcast has distracted plenty of people from getting good work done, right? I'm sure my, my uh, anti-distraction videos have distracted people. <laughs> <laughs> right, good point, good point. But um, given that, or where in that fits in the role of being good at your instrument or getting better at your instrument or learning more about production, how do you balance those things? When do you say, okay, you've done some work, now it's time to hone your skills in how to use a compressor, or it's time for you to learn a new set of chords on that guitar or something like that. So I'm, I'm going to question the question. Okay. You're creating a false dichotomy. What okay. I would suggest anyway, right, could be a false dichotomy there. So you're saying either you do stuff or you get better at right. your craft. Ah. How do you, how do you get better at your craft? By doing stuff. Right. Right. That's the simple answer to, to all of it. Learning, learn the, 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 all the learning that you do, whatever method you use to learn, always, always has to end. If it's going to be learning that is practical and not just uh, learning that ends in you becoming a music production tutor. Well, there's nothing wrong with a music production <laughs> tutor, by the way, but, but I'm just saying, you know, just the actual, in terms of being a music producer, all of that learning at some point needs to be applied to produce a piece of music. Mm -hmm. I, I get sort of fairly militant about it is that if you have limited time and energy to hone your craft, then why not do the only learning that is 100% necessary? The only learning that is necessary is the learning that you do in applying your craft. Mm -hmm. Everything else, everything else is optional that doesn't mean i'm not devaluing it i'm not saying that it's that it's not something you might want to do i'm not saying any of that but all i'm saying is all of it is optional apart from the learning and this is where i actually believe the real learning happens is in the doing doing the thing so instead of learning about the thing let's start doing the thing first and do that at the start. Of, the, the, this is what I suggest. It depends on your kind of uh, body clock and stuff. But what I suggest is doing that first. And if you have time, do the learning that supplements it. But make sure you get that done first, the, the doing of the thing. Because the doing of the thing actually allows, uh, it, it suggests things for you to learn. Right. So out of, the, out of the process of actually finishing a piece of music, you'll go, well, I want to learn about that, but I'm not going to do it now. I'm going to write it down on a piece of paper in, in my journal, and I'm going to keep on finishing what I'm finishing, and then I will have a list of things that I might want to learn instead of watching Netflix this evening. And then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do that. Now, for me, I went to Oxford University and did a very academic degree in music. I did all my music theory and everything. And as a composer of music, as a result of all of the, I mean, it probably, I mean, it's arguable. Well, in some senses, academically uh, uh, speaking, it could be could be argued that I had a, an enviable music musical education. Right. So as a result of all that, I felt uh, very, um, I wasn't very confident as a composer of music, as a musician. Now, in the learning of the production of music, so 
the knobs, right. <laughs> essentially, twiddling the knobs and uh, doing the faders. I did none of that, not a single thing. I figured it out myself. I did it in, in the process of doing it. And I felt very confident as yes. a music producer. Now, that I might be completely deluded about that. Maybe I was no good at anything. I don't know. But just in the result of the two different ways I learned those two different kind of things, I came out of my career being, I don't know, it just like when I was mixing things, when I was uh, kind of doing the, the production side of it, I was just very confident I could just do it. Whereas in the c composition, it was like this, oh, <laughs> and, and, and bear in mind, this isn't because I was naturally gifted at the technical side of, of stuff. As I've already said, I came into this as a technophobe. So I, I'm, su I'm suggesting that my, this approach of the doing of the thing is where you learn and all of the rest of it is optional was the result of you know that came about as a result of the way that I learned. It's very interesting, and it, and it kind of parallels an experience I had. I went to school actually. I went to a jazz school, a jazz performance school, mm -hmm. and um, I and this class of many jazz guitarists worked really hard on scales and form chord forms and all this kind of stuff. And I noticed that at the end of my studies with them, none of them ever did anything as jazz guitarists. They were very technically capable of doing jazz guitar, but none of them were jazz guitarists. But if I would watch them on weekends, they would go out and play in rock bands where they had just kind of learned it by doing it. And they were mm. phenomenal players, and they, they had a lot of joy in it. There's, there's something, too, about when you learn that way, there's joy in it for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is all pointing to a question that is kind of constantly in my mind and I haven't kind of figured it out yet. And that's the difference between art and craft. Yeah. So there is a difference. Yeah. So, so for instance, you can have an absolutely amazing piece of music that is technically not very good. Mm -hmm. And you can have an absolutely terrible piece of music <laughs> that is technically perfect. Right. And I think that is that is the kind of uh, discussion. Have you, have you read a book by Victor Wooten called The Music Lesson? Yes, I have. Yes, so uh, that that kind of also kind of touches on that area it does. about you know what practice is and what music is, right. and I mean I think I I try to because with all of the wonderful people out there providing all of this information for free about VSTs and synthesizers <laughs> and you know all, all of that uh, kind of thing, it's f absolutely fantastic, but it does lead us sometimes I think to forget about the art involved. I think because you know it's kind of teaching all of the the people how to, how this thing works and how to make this kind of sound and uh, all of that kind of thing. And I, I've noticed certainly with the kind of a lot of the younger generation, as I see it anyway, which is my, my my perspective, that it's almost like they're focusing on the wrong things first. You know, it's the notes Mozart. Right, right. <laughs> That's kind of what that, that, I mean. You know, I'm I'm being slightly facetious, but you know, I I feel that let's think about the art first and. No, the craft couldn't be sorted. <laughs> sure. Now, one yeah. of the things I would say is uh, I, recently, because it's kind of been more available, I've kind of gotten entranced by some of the writings of like the modern Stoics, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of what you talk about kind of touches on a similar vein to what they talk about. You know, this this idea of stay focused on doing. Don't let your brain tear down your, your ability to get the job done. Uh, mm -hmm. That sometimes grit is of great value. How much of the concepts that you've developed have come from those kind of philosophies? And how much have come from just talking to people and find out what they're successful with? I'm curious where, where your well comes from. Where is your well? I think it's mainly, it mainly springs from talking to people. Initially, it came from my own creative process okay. and my own experiences, essentially like figuring out what it was that I found the most difficult, what my solutions were to, to those uh, difficulties. I read as widely as I possibly can, all kinds of stuff, and I kind of go through phases. So recently I've been in the science fiction phase and I haven't read fiction for years. Mm -hmm. All kinds of areas. I don't specifically go to one area. It's funny enough, I haven't read too much of uh, the Stoics, but although what I, what I have read, I, I'm definitely nodding my head uh, through it. <laughs> okay. Something else that I've been told a lot is that a, a lot of the way the ways that 
I uh, describe things, people assume that I'm a Buddhist. Uh-huh. And I, I mean, I had no idea what that meant. I mean, I, I've been meditating for years, but not as a Buddhist, just as a, as a, a kind of almost like an effectiveness tool. I've been uh, meditating for years, but I, I then investigated Buddhism. And, I, and like what the, <laughs> it was funny, so much of what the Buddha talks about. I'm like, I mean, not that I'm saying I'm anything like the Buddha, goodness me, no, but I'm, I'm just saying I, I, I'm nodding in agreement to that as well. So I think when you actually look at your experience in an objective way as is possible, and, and part of being objective is knowing that you can never really be objective, you will notice that a lot of this ancient wisdom, if you want to put it all under that un- umbrella, is actually pointing to something that is very true. You know, right. <laughs> So I don't, I don't necessarily think, I mean, it's kind of, it's the same uh, thing as the, the previous discussion we just had, which is that the best teacher, the best mentor, the best coach that you can ever hope for is in your experience of doing something. And it's like the the constant observation of you doing things is all you really need. I, I would suggest that's where all these uh, ph- uh, uh, philosophies spring from. So I think that, that there isn't really one particular area I, t- I take it from. It's in the actual doing of the thing that everything becomes uh, clear. So yeah, once again, I'm coming back to the doing <laughs> sure do you do much music anymore or or uh, is that something that you kind of watch from afar now yeah i decided not to do any music for a while when i first sold something to do with this it was partly just because i needed a break i feel right, right. Uh, but also because i don't know there was something about feeling like there was some kind of conflict of interest going on there <laughs> Whereas, you know, I started doing this as a way of promoting my music, you know, as a kind of a way of talking about my music. But then when I started to sell the thing, uh, then it felt like that wasn't right somehow. Right. At that moment, anyway. And, and I just wanted to focus on the people I was helping and their music rather than always thinking about, oh, you know, how can this help my music and sure. th- that kind of thing. And I just decided to sell all my equipment. I, bur- I burnt my bridges and because oh. <laughs> I kept on getting asked to do this, that and the other. And I sure. felt like one of those aging bank robbers from, from the movies. I, just one more job. <laughs> I was like, right. I need to sell all this stuff. So I, I sold my speakers, sold out uh, absolutely everything. And here I am. Wow. In a way, that makes sense, because I would imagine, given what you do and talking to the people that you do, you know, they're going to want to say, oh, if I could only get him to work on my track. But in doing so, that that, that would feel like a conflict as well. Yes. There would be this constant difficulty in, in figuring out how to manage that kind of stuff. So saying I'm just not doing it probably is the most sensible way to approach it. It is. And it was it was very strange, actually. I had a kind of grieving process for that the music producer in me. Uh-huh. I couldn't listen. I couldn't actually listen to music for about six months. Oh, wow. I found it really, really painful. And uh, now I happily listen to music and I don't, li- and what the wonderful, this is something that I wasn't, didn't expect would happen. I can now listen to music without analyzing it. Oh, oh it's such a, such a relief. Oh, geez. I wish I could do that because <laughs> I'll tell you, I can't listen to music when I drive or when I'm trying to accomplish anything because my ma- brain immediately starts breaking down yes. the production of the track, breaking down the, the background singers, you know, ooh, that was a cool little twist of harmony. You know, and the next thing I know, I'm plowing into a bridge, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can't be doing that's that. Exactly. Yeah, I don't, I don't do that anymore. I can, I can listen to it and it simply enjoy. Oh, that's, uh, that's or, or, or not enjoy. Right, right. <laughs> so, so um, unfortunately, our time is pretty much evaporated. It's been really interesting to talk to you and, and kind of explore different you know, different ways that you think about, about the landscape. For people who have found this interesting and want to know more, um, why don't you tell us where to find out more about, uh, about the services that you provide and uh, give us kind of a quick overview of what those services kind of look like. Well, my website is mikemonday.com and that's where most things are. Um, I do one-to-one coaching. I also run uh, some group what I call masterminds. So that's like groups of uh, music producers and we meet online every two weeks. And then I have all kinds of uh, online courses. I have uh, a kind of membership continuity program where I'm setting people specific goals to do every week 
half of which are in the studio. So I kind of set people these creative games to play with themselves, which results in a piece of music uh, at the end of it. And also things to do outside of the studio, some of which are kind of sort of your ideal future or thinking about, you know, developing different income streams. So I do that as well. And that's called Mission uh, Make Music Your Life. And then I have kind of the standalone courses, one of which you've done, you know, Idea Explosion, Start Now, Finish Fast. But, you know, I, at the moment, I'm really enjoying and really fo- uh, focused on uh, interacting directly with music producers. So the, the, the one-to-one coaching that I do tends to be with the, the kind of successful music producers and DJs, uh, successful in financial terms. I don't, that, that word successful is... is a, <laughs> Success a, a, a comes very, in many different forms. Exactly, right? yeah. exact, exactly. And the masterminds are kind of with highly motivated uh, music producers of all different uh, kinds, from people who are kind of just starting out to people who have been doing it for a, a very uh, long time. So, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of things going on. I, I'm really uh, getting a lot of energy, you know, in, in terms of that unique ability and being fascinated and motivated. What I love doing more than anything else is actually helping people directly by speaking to them. Well, it's been great speaking to you. Um, this was this was a fantastic chat. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Darwin. Much appreciated. my discussion with Mike Monday about the work that he's doing and how he got there. I find his stuff incredible. I'm a real believer in both what he says and how he says it. If you haven't run into his work before, you probably want to start off by checking out either MikeMonday.com or checking out the free videos on YouTube. Uh, But from there, I strongly suggest you get on his mailing list. At least every once in a while, he puts out freebies that uh, are really some helpful stuff. So thanks again for listening uh keep on hanging on we're uh getting really close to good old number 200 so i'm excited to get there and beyond and if you have any questions comments or whatever drop me a line ddg at cycling74.com and we'll get it rolling from there and i will catch you again soon bye